for the second night of training week for GCL. Thank you all for joining us. We're going to have a great night uh, as we get into the second tour. But as we start out, I just want to encourage you, this is part of a bigger project we're doing. It's the 30 days of mission. And we want everyone to be on mission for these uh, this month of time. We're just uh, less than a, a week into it. And these last several days, it's been exciting. Just hearing from different people how God is spurring them on to be on mission. You know, just uh, last night, I was out with uh, family, others that were at uh, married housing on campus, University Village South. And it was there that uh, we got to just be, hey guys, uh, we, we got to go out and share with people. Uh, we did some prayer on the porch. We got to pray for folks. We got people from uh, Bangladesh, from Haiti, uh, from Nepal, uh, from China. So it was great. Uh, and uh, even somebody that we knew that was a part of GCL. And that was neat to get to pray with her as well. So uh, a tremendous time uh, for, for me. Sometimes you, you have an opportunity to, to uh, encourage and minister uh, where you're not expecting. One person we asked for if they had a prayer request, they mentioned some different things related to, to COVID and stuff. And then they, they paused and they said, you know, I need prayer for my marriage. And so we, we stopped and, and we, we shared some principles with him, but and then we, we prayed for his marriage. And we talked about even getting back together to see uh, how we could encourage him in the marriage. We just finished up a, uh, a love and respect series with couples and we thought, man, something like that would be great for you to take to others. So maybe, who knows, it could work out to something like that. It could lead to other opportunities. But uh, just a way to, to minister to people as we go out in faith not knowing uh, if we're going to share the gospel with a certain person, minister to them, just just alone praying for people, I think is a, is a tremendous opportunity. So I encourage you, join us. Uh, in fact, at the end of our, our time with a uh, training week, Saturday afternoon, after we do a little bit of training, we're going to actually go out and, and we'll talk more about that, but uh, it'll be another opportunity to be out and, and do a prayer on the porch. So I'm going to grab this sheet here. And here, if you were with us uh, yesterday, or excuse me, Monday night, uh, we had the first field of the, the five parts, four fields. And it dealt with uh, entry. If you remember, we talked about uh, just being, developing uh, and understanding who our oikos is, those circle of friends that God's put us around, those unbelievers that he may want us to, to uh, use us definitely in prayer to be praying for them, but also opportunity to, to share with them and get into the gospel. So uh, we, as we discussed that, we also uh, hit on uh, the aspect of what a person of peace is, just those who, as, as you have the opportunity to, to share with them, build into their lives, they know others, and uh, they really link us in the gospel to other unbelievers around them, and it's a, a tremendous opportunity. Uh, we also talk about going out two by two, that initiative evangelism, which is also a key part, so you've got the the oikos or friendship evangelism, you've got initiative evangelism. And that's that's that entry point. Where, where do you go? Uh, well, you know, it could be your neighborhood, it could be campus, it could be um, where you work, um, all kind of possibilities. But uh, are we ready to uh, you know, just identify, first off, who are those people that God wants us to reach? So from there, we go to uh, the second field, which is the gospel, and that's what we're going to tackle tonight. Um, 
we're going to get into, uh, you know, we've already talked about who do we go to. Now we're going to talk about, okay, well, what, what do we say? And get into very practicals about, okay, what, what do I share with people? So that's going to cover tonight. And then uh, tomorrow night, this third field, disciple. And here we'll just talk about, okay, now that if, if you've seen someone saved or you're, you get to, to touch base with a new believer, they want uh, to be built into it uh, as you're making disciples. How do you go about that? And we'll talk about that. And then uh, Saturday morning, we'll finish up. We'll talk about the church. And uh, just, it's, it's about gathering. Well, once you've got uh, people who are growing, you bring them together. And it's that encouragement to, uh, to see them grow as a body as God intended in the church. And then lastly, the, in, in the center here, we've got uh, leadership and uh, just that emphasis on uh, we, we want to be ones who are influencing others and, and encouraging them to do the same as they, they pursue the four fields. So uh, excited about uh, what, what we have in store tonight. I want to encourage you. Uh, this is this is the overview that we're going to be going through. It, it puts all the pieces together. So keep that in mind. And with that, uh, I'm going to uh, have Jan come up and share with us about the, the driving force, really, uh, without which none of this is is going to fly. Uh, it really is. You know. We, it's through our own strength then that we're uh, we're trying to pursue these tools and and uh, get out the gospel. But uh, Jan's going to share uh, that emphasis. I'll let her tell tell you what it is. So uh, when I think of praying for the lost, um, I think of. Or when I think of sharing the gospel with the lost, I think of, boy, I better be praying beforehand because it's not about me. It's about God doing a work beforehand. And so that when I meet the, my friends or uh, my neighbors, I think, well, this is an opportunity because God, I've already been praying for it. And I just need to trust now that God's going to use this opportunity. But I was, uh, my, one of my favorite books I found in a uh, Goodwill store one time was called uh, Praying Effectively for the Lost. <laughs> and it has really helped me in understanding my role um, in praying for their salvation. And so I was just going to share a few of the thoughts that were in this book. So uh, first of all, what, what is God's part in praying for the lost? And in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, he says that, first of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions, and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. And then, and then he talks about the kings and the leaders. But then he goes, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So really, like it's first of all, God really desires that. That's on his heart, first of all, on his heart. Jesus is also our example in that. Um, in Isaiah 53, uh, the prophecy, it says, Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. And then he fulfilled that in Luke 23, 34. He says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Jesus, it was on his heart just to pray for the lost. Um, and then in Hebrews 7, 25, it says that, therefore, he is able to save, also to save forever, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So Jesus is always interceding for us, always interceding for the lost, and um, just like we should. <laughs> There's a well-known revivalist, Charles Finney, he's written many books, but um, he said, in the case of an impenitent friend, one who does not uh, repent, uh, the very condition on which he is to be saved from hell may be the fervency and importance of your prayer for that individual. So three reasons we pray for the lost. So the first one is our love for them. If you don't love them, pray for love. <laughs> pray that you love them the lost. Um, it said that prayer is love on its knees. In John 3, 16, you know, for God so loved the world. It was his love that caused Jesus to go to the cross. Um, in Luke 20, I'm sorry, in Luke 6, 
27, it talks about the rich man in hell. He was compelled by his love for his five brothers. So he prayed for them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And we visited the Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago. And there's a, an 18-foot neon sign that says, Mother's prayers have followed you. You know, that love of a mother has led many people to their salvation. Um, so the first one, we reason we pray for the lost is our love for them. The second one is faith. <coughs> faith is another biblical basis for praying for the lost. Jesus said, all things are possible to him who believes in Mark 9, 23. Um, in Mark 2, 5, four men brought their paralyzed friend to Jesus and seeing their faith, he, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. And they brought him to be healed, but they, he also received forgiveness of sins. And then the third reason is that the, the Bible describes the mighty power. There's a lot of power behind prayer. Uh, in James 5.16, it says, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Um, there's a story or in this book that talks about the atomic bomb. It says, when the atomic bomb was dropped on Japan during World War II, some 92,000 people were killed. But when Assyria besieged Jerusalem, causing King Hezekiah to cry out to God on behalf of his people, he sent an angel that slew 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night. Hezekiah's prayer was two times as explosive as the atomic bomb. So a prayer strong enough to destroy armies, how much more certain is it to the power there to save souls? So what is your conviction on whether or not you need to pray for the unsaved person to be saved? You know, I think all of us would say, yeah, I, I think we should pray. I think we should pray that they get saved. Um, but do we truly understand that necessity to pray? So um, I was just going to look real quick at the biblical portrayal of the lost. In John 8, 44, it says that they are children of the devil, that in Acts 26, 18, it says they're under the authority of Satan, uh, a strong man's house, it talks about in Mark 3, 27, and in Isaiah 14, 17. I'm talking really fast. <laughs> so that was John 8, 44, Acts 26, 18, Mark 3, 27, and then Isaiah 14, 17, the prisoners of war. And then in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, that they're blinded to the gospel. So there's huge reasons to be praying for the lost. Um, just there's this, all this Satan's authority over them. So we're going to look real quick at 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. It says, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So Satan has blinded the minds of the lost specifically to keep them from understanding the gospel. Um, I was going to read Spurgeon's, Charles Spurgeon. He was a, one of the greatest preachers um, of all time, I think. But here's his testimony of conversion. He says, I confess that I had been tutored in piety, put in my cradle by prayerful hands, and lulled to sleep by songs about Jesus. I heard the gospel continually, yet when the word of the Lord came to me of power, it was as new as if I had lived among the unvisited tribes of Central Africa and had never heard the tidings of the cleansing foundation, filled with blood, drawn from the Savior's veins. When for the first time I received the gospel and my soul was saved, I thought that I had never really heard it before. I began to think that the preachers to whom I had lis listened had not truly preached it. But on looking back, I'm inclined to believe that I had heard the gospel fully preached many hundreds of times before. This was the difference. I then heard it as though I did not hear it. And when I did hear it, the message may not have been any clearer in itself than it had been at former times, but the power of the Holy Spirit was present to open my ears and to guide the message to my heart. Then I thought I had never heard the truth preached before, and now I'm persuaded that the light shone often on my eyes, but I was blind. Therefore, I thought that the light had never come there. The light was shining all the while, but there was no power to receive it. Ah, the eyeball of the soul was not sensitive to the divine beings. I think that testimony just shows how powerful prayer can be. We really need to pray that people's eyes are not blinded, and that they would hear and understand the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says, uh, But the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. 
So we need to pray that the Holy Spirit re removes these demonic blinders of the unsaved and opens the mind and the heart to the gospel. Otherwise, it's just foolishness in these years. There's an evangelist in the 1800s who wrote, until we recognize the strong man fully armed at the back of all darkness of God and the blindness to the gospel, we shall not do much towards bringing men out of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. And until we know how to take heed to the Lord's warning and first find the strong man, the attempts we make to spoil his goods will only enrage him and enable him to strengthen his armor and guard his house in peace. So this, hopefully this urges you all to just take key to praying for the lost we need to open their hearts and minds to Jesus. I recommend that. Lois, you, you mentioned it in college and I bought it and I read it and to this day, stuff in that book is stuck with me in terms of praying for the lost. I'm a huge fan. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mom. So I'm going to share going into going and actually what we're using to go and share this good news. And so in in light of talking about prayer, uh, one way that we get to, uh, something that we get to offer that not many people um, offer often <laughs> is prayer. Um, just, you know, a person walking around, it's pretty rare that someone just asks, can I pray for you? And so one thing that we get to do, um, and one example is getting to go uh, prayer walking. And so what that looks like is getting to knock on, whether it's it's your neighbor's doors or going to a, a community and getting to knock on doors. I know different ones here have even been going each like twice a week to uh, meet people and just knocking on the door. And this is pretty much you know, what happens. Knock. And I open it. it might be a few seconds, I might be getting a little nervous inside. Uh, I know I do, and so don't be fearful because it's, it's definitely a reaction you have. Uh, but then you're waiting, you're waiting, and then they open, and you say, Hi, I'm Kelly. This, this is my friend uh, Dave. And we're in light of what's going on in the world, uh, we're just wanting to care for people. Uh, is there a way, uh, like, how can we pray for you? And from then, you know, they might say, wow, like, thank you. Um, you pray for my, my grandma. She's sick right now. Um, or they might say, um, this is kind of weird. You know, like, <laughs> um, but I, you know, I don't really, I think I'm good. You know, I'm good. You say, okay, well, can I ask you a question? And, you know, a lot of times they will say, sure. You know, you can. and so if you... For, for the first response, um, they, if they say, yeah, like I need prayer for my grandma, um, right then just say, well, can we pray right now? And go ahead and take a few minutes to just pray with them. And uh, I think that is something that is super special that they may have never had an experience like that to have someone care for them in that way. Um, and then from there, kind of transitioning into a conversation. Not in, I think, you know, it's totally fine if you keep moving on, but I think there's such an opening to, like, you've cared for this person, and then you get to lead into, um, one, you can say, hey, uh, I have a question for you. Do you think you would spend eternity in heaven if you were to die today? And then uh, just getting to hear the response and going into more questions, uh, the diagnostic questions of, you know, on a scale of zero dollar percent, how certain are you, you go to heaven. And then getting to share, like, can I share with you, um, like, how, uh, someone share with me how I could be certain. Um, another transition is, man, yeah, I'm so glad we got to meet you. Uh, can I share with you, you know, how Jesus has changed my life? And sometimes you can just go right into your testimony, um, don't have to that you just say well for me you know i grew up and then go into your testimony and so um so yeah right now we're going to take some time to practice that with we're going to get into pairs um we're going to have breakout rooms where you're going to have this pair i think for the rest of the time is that correct or is it going to be random you have this pair for the rest of the time so um you know 
just go right into it when you get into those pairs. Try not to spend too much time uh, just talking about random things, but really practice. Um, another encouragement is write notes during this time. Uh, the the faintest, let's see, the this is something that I remember. The faintest ink is more powerful than the strongest memory. So mm -hmm. that's something that Tom Short shared with me, and I'm like, man, I need to write down everything because if I think I remember it, I probably won't. Um, so, okay, so you're practicing just, all right, you knock on the door. Hey, you know, my name is Kelly, and this is my friend, Dave. And uh, in light of what's going on in the world today, we're just going around caring for people and want to ask how we can pray for you. So, and then from there, you can practice transitions um, of, so when there's a time in my life, but you can stop it right there. Um, so go ahead and we're gonna take a few minutes. How, how long do they have? You have about five minutes. So try to have both, both people get a chance to practice that. So go ahead. I'm really tired. You go first.
let you know when I will. Okay. All right, so hope that went well, and it's okay. It takes some time. Like, it's not anything too hard for anyone to do. So don't feel like, oh man, I have to reach this certain uh, time when I can speak with eloquence. Because the Bible actually talks about how <laughs> a lot of people that didn't have eloquent words, and all the more God gets to be shown in your life and His His power through you. So. Um, now we're going to transition into what, yeah, what do we share? So maybe on a prayer walk or going out to people or friends um, that have maybe never heard the gospel clearly. Um, we have, you know, I have my story and we also have God's story. And so I'm first going to, I'm just going to share my story. Um, we're going to do a 15 second testimony. And so this is something that I know a lot of times I'll be on the bus. Well, not now. I used to be on the bus a lot <laughs> going to college. <laughs> and I had a 15 minute drive on the bus. And there were people coming on and off all the time. And I remember sitting there and being like, okay, I have a little bit of time with this person. And I get to use this time however I want. Um, but a lot of times I got to ask them like, hey, do you have any spiritual background or um, I want to share my story with you. Um, you know, this is, so this is the 15 seconds testimony because you don't know how long you'll have with someone um, might be in the store or uh, like yesterday, Monday, I think it was Monday. I went into the store Publix and I got some food and this person, uh, I just asked her how I could pray for her during this time. And she shared a prayer request. And then two days later, which is today, this morning at 7 a.m., I was at Publix again getting something for my office. And I got in her line because she was there. I said, hey, I just want to see how that's going. Uh, I know I'd I've been praying for you. And she's like, oh, wow. She's like, hi, uh, yeah, I actually need to contact that friend that you were praying for. But keep asking me, please. And she, it meant a lot to her. And so from that, I got to share my 15 second testimony uh, because there was someone behind me. And so they were still getting a few things. So I was like, okay, I have a little bit of time. So, <laughs> yes. Yes. My story. You can go ahead and write this down um, on your journal or a piece of paper. All right, so I'm first going to share my my 15 second testimony and then I'll, I'll share how to do it and how you can write yours. And so, uh, so yeah, I, oh, I feel like I met at the store. So, hey, Mary. Yeah, I, you know, thanks for, for checking me out. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so weird. Thanks for helping me get my groceries. And is there anything I can pray for you? And then they, yeah, you don't have to write down everything that I'm saying. Um, Caitlin's going to rebuff me afterwards. <laughs> um, so after they share their prayer request, um, you know, Mary, uh, for me, you know, Jesus has really changed my life. There was a time in my life when I was selfish and fearful. But then I understood Jesus' forgiveness of my sin, and I've transferred my trust to Jesus. And now I have a lot of joy, and, and I'm satisfied in him. Do you have a story like that? So that's my 15-second testimony. It might have even been seven seconds. I don't know. But, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, so this first part is the intro. And so... Right. 
there was a time in my life when, and then this is before you knew Jesus. So you can think of two words that describe what your life was like before you had your trust in Jesus. Some of you maybe got saved at an early age. And so that can be kind of difficult. Like, okay, at age five or six, uh, how I describe myself. And I think for me, um, I think I put two words that describe maybe how my life was maybe before I grew in my relationship with Jesus and really understood uh, more of his forgiveness. And so you can kind of share two words that maybe describe your life um, before you knew Jesus and made that decision or uh, that describe two words like that maybe you weren't a changed person yet. <laughs> um, but because of Jesus, he has changed those areas. And so there's a time in my life when, and for me, so these two words, you can fill in the blank. So think of them. So mine are fearful. And then my second word was selfish. So go ahead and think of those two words. And then this is when Jesus comes in the picture. And so these words, um, it's a little more flexible, but the main thing is that you want Jesus to be definitely a part of your testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's just, you know, then I was fearful and selfish, and then I believed in God, and then I am now happy and saved. And I think why we bring in Jesus is without Jesus, we would not have that relationship with God. And so um, it's important that we write how we, we have that relationship is through Jesus. And so... Then I understood that Jesus forgave my sin. And I transferred my trust him. And then this is where you draw an arrow of how your life has changed since you put your trust in Jesus. And so now you're going to write down two words that would describe your life now after. So for me, um, there was a time in my life when, and then I was fearful and selfish. Then I understood that Jesus forgave my sin and I, and I transferred my trust in him. And now I am joyful <coughs> and satisfied. And then this is when you say, do you have a story like that? All right, so I'm going to say it real quick, and then you guys are going to get into your breakout sessions and practice that. Um, and make sure at the end you say, and do you have a story like that? Just to practice having a, a conversation versus just talking about me. And so, <clears throat> so Mary, there was a time in my life when I was selfish and fearful, and then I understood that Jesus forgave my sin, and now I am joyful uh, and satisfied because my trust is now in him. And do you have a story like that? And so it's a pretty simple way of getting to share the gospel um, through a very short period of time. And who knows how God is going to really use that to open people's eyes to like, man, if Jesus has changed this person's life, like that's, that's pretty cool. And like, I want to maybe seek that out, um, how he could do that in my life. Uh, so go ahead and we'll get into breakout rooms and you can go ahead and practice that and ask the question to the other person and they can answer. So go ahead.
Hey everyone, I'm Brian from the Y. I'm Monel. Also known as Dad with an X. Monel, for all you DC comic fans out there, you get it. <laughs> that's no one, right? <laughs> literally no one. Yeah, like, well, yeah, yeah. Quiet you. Anyway, uh, so we're going to talk about uh, transitioning uh, into gospel conversations or spiritual conversations, maybe outside of a formal sharing time. Right? We just sort of practice our, our prayer on the porch approach. But uh, unless you're like, I'm sure someone, I can't think of an example, you probably don't pray on the porch all day. Um, maybe Mateo does, I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, anyway, so, uh, we just wanted to sort of hit some principles and some practicals that we thought would help. How do we, how can we be thinking missionally and living missionally while, uh, in, in our everyday interactions? And so uh, I just got a, a, a couple thoughts, uh, and we have some examples and whatever. And so hopefully this is profitable for you. Uh, so the first thing I want to bear in mind as we, as we talk about some of these principles is that there are two types of lost people. Uh, right, men and women. No, uh, uh, lost people you know and lost people you don't. Right, or uh, uh, we all know like some people say like, oh man, it's so hard to share with grandma, but I can I can do prayer on the porch all day or whatever. Or something like, oh, I, I've shared with all my family members, but you know, going out or sharing with my classmates is really hard or whatever. And so as we think of the, through these principles, we want to be thinking like they they might look differently, although still be applicable to to people I know and with whom I have an ongoing relationship versus someone I might only see once or twice. Oh. So the first thing we need to bear in mind is that boldness is required, right? The, uh, the enemy, uh, your sin nature, and even the world system, right, are all against you swinging to spiritual conversation. They'd much rather you be polite or, uh, or silent, right? And so, so boldness is going to be required to do this, right? And, and to think that it won't, um, uh, or I, I'll only wait for moments where perhaps it's easy or something, is is a, a foolish endeavor and it, and it really is a lie coming at you uh from the enemy or from your own flesh that doesn't want to engage in spiritual conversations and so we need to be quick to identify those lies and say no uh, <coughs> pardon me uh next is uh maybe maybe a, a, a twist on this lie is um i want to say the principle is confidence trumps awkwardness right I don't know how many times uh, people say, right, like, oh, it's just too awkward to bring it up with grandma or, you know, uh, Uncle Johnny always just looks down on me and so he won't listen to me anyway. Or I don't know what my classmate's going to think. Maybe they won't eat lunch with me anymore or whatever. Um, I don't know if people didn't eat lunch with me in high school at all. So um, uh, anyway, that's, uh, I was a loser. Uh, anyway, so uh, but, like, I wasn't very confident either. Uh, the idea is I... Uh, uh, if, right, like, uh, if society, right, uh, has said that it's like, it's not um, polite to talk about religion or religious things or ask people about their religious beliefs, right, uh, there's a couple things. One, uh, it's sort of, uh, we have to recognize it's kind of pathetic to say I'm afraid of awkwardness, right, like, in the same way where it's fair to like, like, it's kind of weird if I said I'm afraid of bunnies. It's like, I'm not, but that would be like, like, oh, Brian, come on. Um, like, uh, like maybe I was traumatized by a buddy. I wasn't, um, but like, like, uh, in the same way, like awkwardness is pretty low on the same, like, uh, like I'm afraid of being mugged, right? You know, I'm afraid of something happening to one of my kids, right? Like, like that's, that's kind of a bigger fear. And so if we let a fear of awkwardness slow us down, uh, we need to, uh, we need to think about like in general, our character with respect to courage. Uh, additionally though, uh, right. If, uh, do you have something? Uh, you can all, <laughs> you can always, if you want to go over your fear of awkwardness, you can always practice being intentionally awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. Okay, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exhibit A. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing is, right, like, uh, that's fair, right? And, and I think, and that's where confidence does come in, right? If you are willing to be confident in the conversation, hey, I'm bringing up something that's taboo. Right, think about right. All, all like all those political people in Trillington or whatever who are like, hey, we're not supposed to talk about politics, but like they say, like, hey, this is I, I'm creating a space where I'm talking about politics. Mm -hmm. So uh, so now it's like, oh, so it's okay or whatever, right? In the same way, if if you hem and haw about bringing up religious beliefs versus if you just confidently ask as if it's a totally normal thing, uh, it will it'll affect the tenor of the conversation, mm -hmm. and and that'll give your by you projecting confidence, it's giving them the confidence that it's mm -hmm. okay for them to respond. Yeah. I've actually been surprised how, how many examples I've heard of people that just like ask like, um, like 
I was thinking, do you ever like wonder if God exists or something like that? I've heard so many stories of uh, conversations like that and non-Christians like, yeah, like, like people, people think about these things. Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm-hmm. I certainly hope so. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so if we want to be confident, if we want to be bold, right? There's a couple of things that we need to think about confidence then. I mean, one confidence comes with preparation and there's a, and there's a few things you can do to grow in that one, right? Hey, training week, good job. You're here or watching it later or whatever. Uh, but uh, some of that can help is, is developing our scripts in the same way, right? That we have our script for our, our testimony or for our knock on the door to make that as painless as possible and almost make it second nature, which means you can be more confident in it. We can for other things too. Uh, something that we were talking about earlier, one of the things that I've uh, learned, uh, I really picked up from my brother, although he doesn't use it for the gospel, but just in general, is whenever I see someone like a veteran hat on or a police officer, I'll, I'll go up there, shake their hands, well, I just don't shake hands anymore, but whatever, when COVID's over, I'll start shaking hands again and thank them for their service and then just immediately ask them if I can pray for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's just, that, like, that's just my script now. So like when I see a veteran, I don't even think about it anymore. And so now I'm confident in that, in like in engaging and bringing up a spiritual conversation with a stranger in, in that context, right? Now, obviously not everyone's a veteran. Um, and I still don't know what to do with the ROTC people. Like, thank you for the service you'll probably do or something like, I don't know. So, but uh, but having having some some set scripts, it's just like, okay, I know, and I can, again, I can, it'll help you be confident as opposed to, I got to think about what I'm going to say. It's like, oh no, I know kind of the path I'm going down. Obviously a script doesn't replace the Holy Spirit, but it can be a tool that gives us confidence. Right. <laughs> Another thing, is if we, I, I, I would like to interject. Um, I encourage uh, early on, always always rely on the Holy Spirit. But the more, but but starting with scripts um, gives you confidence, and, and as you grow in confidence, it'll you'll be able to improvise increasingly, um, and uh, and tailor more the situation. Don't be afraid of scripts early on. Oh yeah, that's that's true, right? Yeah. Like once uh, once you know something better, you're yeah. able to adapt it more. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah, and we do that with our three thirds and all that too, right? Right. I, I follow the pattern, mm-hmm. and now I know how to manipulate it to get to the same right. result. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, another thing we we're, 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 we've mentioned it already, and uh, and Jan did a great job talking about praying for the lost, but is is having a dynamic names map. And by di- dynamic, I mean two things. One, it's changing, right? Like, oh, as I meet people, I'm actually adding people to it, uh, and that's in the co- coming into the third days of mission. Like, oh, I need to be better about keeping my names map updated uh, and dynamic in that way. But also, as opposed to, right, I, I've noticed uh, one, of, one of the parts is that I've been praying with my kids. Like, during, whenever we pray before eating nap time or bed, I sort of basically give them people from my names map to pray for. Hey, pray for Uncle Kurdic and Rhoda and Graham, right? And so they say, we pray for Uncle Kurdic, Rhoda, and Graham. And like, but to the point now where, like, they just, they just recite it now. And it's like, oh, they're not really thinking about it. And I'm like, oh, man, me too. Like, am I, am I actually thinking about what, what Uncle Kurdic is going through right now? And I was like, oh, man, if I'm praying, like, hey, Bob is looking for a job, so I'm going to pray, God, please provide a job for Bob and use that for your glory and to, as a step to draw him to you. And so when I see Bob, uh, that's a real person, by the way, right, right, that's not just a random name. Anyway, like, I, I've been thinking about his actual situation. And so how much yeah. easier is it going to be for him to feel cared for if I say, hey, right. Bob, have you found that job yet? Right. So, uh, were you going to add that, no. right? Oh, no. Okay. Um, well, I will afterward. Okay, cool. <laughs> Uh, finally, uh, in, in this sort of uh, prep time, is like thinking of what questions am I going to ask? Uh, when we were, we were doing Prayer on the Porch yesterday, we got invited into a couple's uh, house. They're from Nepal. And I know very little about Nepal. But I'm going, and he said, and he said oh, yeah, I'm here studying. I study nematodes. I'm like, oh, I think I remember that. Like, those are roundworms, round right? Like, you got the annelids and the nematodes and the flatworms or something. He's like, nope. Uh, <laughs> all right well okay i tried like i, I like one i was showing an effort right like making an effort to like hey i'm interested in your field or whatever but she was like okay well this is a topic i can either ask more questions just to say like hey i'm interested in you or i can move away from like where can we find common ground to talk about uh and so to to make the if, if i'm worried about awkwardness or to make yeah. everyone feel more comfortable as we're engaging like right? yeah. we just met and i'm sitting in his living room yeah Common ground, like noticing people, people feel very loved if you went like by noticing things about them because that shows you care. Like like asking them about, oh, what's the logo on your hat? Or I don't know, like, like oh, do you like that thing that your brain memorability is associated with? Yeah. Yeah. And I found that when they when you ask a question, right, and there's some <laughs> basic questions, right? Like, and they give you the answer, a follow-up does a ton to say, like, hey, I actually cared and listened to your response. Like, hey, what's your major? 
I'm an electrical yeah. engineer. I can move on. He's okay. Now I know you're made. I know you, I have my stereotype of electrical engineer. I say, oh, this is me being stupid or whatever. But I say, what sort of things would you like to engineer electrically <laughs> or whatever? I like just like, oh, like <laughs> electrical engineers can do a lot. I don't yeah. know what. So like, what draws you to that field? And I'm too like. One, I'm getting more information, more personalized information, and I'm showing like, hey, I listened, and I care right. about you and where, where that's going. Yeah. So, uh, finally, that sort of, uh, or like the last couple things for me, and then I know you got some, some good stuff, mm -hmm. uh, is that confidence also will grow with practice. And here's the yes. thing, we can, we can like break into our, our pairs or whatever, and like, hey, pretend like you're my Aunt Gertrude, and she's this, 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 and I'm gonna try to talk to you. Yeah. But, uh, but really, Every conversation you have with someone is practice. Yep. Uh, and, and we should recognize like some are harder than others, right? My, like, my grandfather never wanted me to talk about it, right? Like he, uh, he gave up his faith at a very young age and uh, really uh, just some of the things he had gone through to the, like, there's just no way God could exist. And so anytime I brought it up, he sort of like, like a pat on the head. And like that was much harder than some other family members I've, I've spoken with. Or trying to like get my gospel share in while I'm, you know, checking like at the gas station or whatever. Like, hey, we're both pumping gas. Like, like that. That is a very like sort of quick, high pressure situation. So like, recognize like, oh man, that didn't go super well, or I don't know how to do that well. But other conversations are easier. So I would say like, in every conversation, even if it's just like I'm afraid to bring up spiritual things, well then your practice is let's let me just find out what faith are you or what is your faith background. This help I it helped me a lot for gator nights where. When I would invite, invite people over for dinner, I was like, I want to know where they are spiritually before they come so I know how to when yeah. we have dinner. And so what I would start doing is like, I would ask people if they had any dietary restrictions. Initially, that's what I was just saying. Do you have any dietary restrictions? Like, a lot of Indians would come over and a lot of vegetarians. So but then I started saying like, do you have any, di like any, instead of dietary restrictions, I'd say, do you have any food allergies or religious prohibitions on what you can eat or like, or religious reasons not to eat things. Mm -hmm. And so I brought religion into the conversation. And that was good practice for me. Uh, to sort of in that domain. Again, it's partly script, but partly uh, practice. And now I just think that whenever I invite someone over here now, now that's part of what I do. And it brings sort of religion into the thing. Yeah. Um, and finally, like this is all well and good and every tool is awesome or whatever. That's not true. They're probably really terrible tools. Um, it's like, we've, we've been listening to everything is awesome. The boys love that song. Um, <laughs> and you haven't seen the Lego movie. Um, anyway, um, the, but like the power comes from God. Right, and so again, we need to be in prayer, uh, mm -hmm. and we need to recognize like uh, you could totally fumble your transition and be terrible, but like if the Holy Spirit's moving, the Holy Spirit's moving. So we want to we want to be good stewards, and we want to be prepared, and we want to do everything we can on our end. But if we're disconnected from the power source, it's all in vain. Yeah. So, I uh, <clears throat> I'll jump off what he was saying about um, like um, noticing people asking them questions about themselves. I think a key thing here is showing them that you care about them. Like, I think we all care about them, but when you're, when you're talking to someone, actually this applies to strangers as well. Um, but really like establishing that you care is essential. There's this saying that people don't um, care what you know until they know that you care. And I think that that's important here. Um, various actions that, I'm gonna, that we're kind of talking about show that you love the person, make them more open. And that shouldn't be a discouragement to boldness. Um, I, um, as I've been kind of thinking about this, and I'm weak in this, honestly, but what I'm kind of aspiring to, and I'm convinced of by listening to a lot of people's um, positive experiences around this, is that um, we should be bold in the topics, um, and that love has a lot to do with, with the tone we use and the way we ask, and um, but that surprisingly, if you approach things the right way, people are, most people are pretty open to talking about most topics. Um, worst case, if, if you say something and they get like really offended, there is an open door there because then you can ask for forgiveness and like you're right on a good step um, right there. Um, a little side note, th ways you can transition from your own life um, that have helped me in the past. Um, I uh, just I I aspire to be more of a person. When you ask me like how's it going, that I would answer with spiritual things like like oh I'm stressed about all the work on my plate, but God is helping me trust Him that He's working things for good. Um, I aspire to be more like that. I want to be like that around Christians and non-Christians. Um, that that is bringing up spiritual things right on the spot just in response to how are you. Um, and 
and generally I want to think in advance, like how do the things in my life connect to God so that I can just name drop God. Um, and then back to the subject of asking questions. I think that listening and asking questions is really key here. Um, listening and showing that you care about the answer often opens the door to you sharing. Um, and uh, oh, on top of that, um, at this showing that you care, uh, making observations about nonverbals like, um, like, oh, you, you seem kind of sad when you said that, kind of gets people to open up more. And um, if I, if I yeah. add it, right, like, it, when someone shares a situation, like, how are you doing or whatever, and like, yeah. and you would expect an emotion to be attached with that, I think it, it, I, I found it very helpful to say, right, like, oh, that sounds very, and let me guess your emotion. Right. And, uh, and if, if, if I'm correct, I'm not super motive, so it's not always, yeah. yeah. Uh, you can talk to Jay in my house church. She'll be like, like 50% of the time, Brian's just entirely off. Yeah. Um, which pretty, that's a coin flip, right? Um, anyway, uh, the, uh, but it's like, if they say no, right, like, Brian, you're totally off. No, I actually feel this way. And now they're sharing more about themselves. Yeah. But if you're right, like, yes, yeah. you get me, and I'm going to share more. Yeah. And uh, so often, getting to know the person, you can, like, find ways to connect things back to God. I, um, I encourage you to... Um, <clears throat> ask like like when you're confused about anything like dial into that um i had a muslim friend um i was asking he said he wants to grow in taqwa i said what's taqwa he said that's kind of sort of like closeness to god um and i was i wish i had responded like a question because i was like oh muslims care about closeness to god i wish i responded something why would God even want to be close to you and like get his response? And, and maybe he was like, Oh, I don't know. And, and like, what, what would it look like if God actually, if God was like showing a desire to be close to you? Um, another example I want to give, um, I, uh, that, that can really help with bringing in, um, like God's truth. Um, very, like very much showing that you care. This is all along those lines. Uh, I once, I heard, I think it was in God's space. Um, there's a book called God's space that I am getting a lot of these things from. Um, there, there was a uh, guy who was talking to someone who was like, Oh, I think all religions point to God. And, um, I, uh, uh, <laughs> and the, this guy, the author responded. Um, so it's kind of like God's at the top of a mountain and everyone's coming, coming from a different point of, at the base, but you're all ending up at the top eventually. And the guy responded, yeah, that's right. I'm like, yeah, you got it. And then the, the author said, what if God came down from the mountain? And the guy was like, oh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, and I really want to point out that he, um, he got a, that's right. Um, <laughs> Getting someone that, like, there's a difference between saying, like, you're right, and, like, that's right. And um, <laughs> uh, and it, 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 that he showed, I understand what you mean. Like, it, like, I understand where you're coming from, that I can articulate back to you. But have you thought about this? Um, and I think that's a great kind of two, like, one, like, here's where you're coming from, right? Yeah. I'm like, ooh, what about this? And that, that's a good general way to get things. Um, I am out of time. Can I, oh, yeah. can I just put the other side of that for you? Yeah. I mean, if we can be affirming to them as well. I, I think mm -hmm. uh, I remember I was walking uh, Andrew R Ruay, and she's an old GCLer. I think she's in Jacksonville now. Uh, she, I was walking with her, and she was talking with someone. Uh, uh, and it was just so masterfully done. Uh, she's like, we were, we were on vacation or whatever, a bunch of us. And... And so I'm like, what was, the, what was the most exciting thing you did today? And she's like, oh, we went to, we were in a cathedral and then mass suddenly started. And, uh, and it, was, it was beautiful to hear, but we didn't understand a single word of it. And we realized for thousands of years, uh, when the mass was done in Latin, most of Europe didn't know what was going on, but they were going to church every Sunday. And that just really hit me, which got them onto a spiritual conversation. And Andrew used to say, like, what do you think about uh, who goes to heaven or whatever? And the, the, the woman who responded said, oh, I think as long as you're good enough, you go to heaven. And, like, the easy answer is, no, uh stupid, or right, right, like, right. right. You show those, they still call it stupid, right? But, like, mm -hmm. but instead she said, you're right, how, or I agree, or whatever, how good do you think you have to be? Right. And so she affirmed her, mm -hmm. like, she gave the yes. Right. 
and they get it, it built a bridge and then it, but then ask the question because they obviously meant different things. Yeah. Yeah, I um I really want to encourage um I I'm as I'm growing in, I'm weak in the boldness part. As I'm growing in, I'm as like I said, I'm coming to realize that I think any topic is valid. What just really really matters is my tone and how I ask to show that I'm not just pushing something. Um, I uh, a, like a really good way without being gimmicky about this is just to say I'm wondering. I'll I, I'll post somewhere if there's somewhere afterward. There's like a list of 90 wondering questions in God's space. Um, but like just questions like uh, that's an interesting perspective. I'm wondering how you arrived at that conclusion. If I could arrange for you to speak at my church uh, about your impression with Christians, I'm wondering what you'd say. I'm wondering what role religion has played in shaping your life. Like these are all questions that that are open ended that give the other per that are like you're directing things towards spiritual things, but on on their terms in terms of like like you're setting the subject, but they're you're letting them share about their life. Um, I I think open ended questions about specific topics. Like I, something I use a lot is just like, who's Jesus to you? And, and like asking that, asking that like in a genuine tone, like I want to hear like, who's Jesus to you? Um, like you're, you're being very specific in the topic, but asking in a tone that like, oh, you're welcome to share any answer. You're not going to like judge them for like, no, that's not who Jesus is, but, <laughs> but you really want to hear them. Um, and uh, last of all, um, the wonderful thing about personal relationships with people is that if any, if anything, if you make a, like a sinful mistake, you know, can always ask later um, for forgiveness. And if you're insufficiently bold, you can always, and like the conversation doesn't go anywhere, um, you can always come back later and say, I was thinking about our last conversation and I was wondering, da da da. And so uh, that's, that's everything I did here. Yeah. So go have those conversations. Yeah. I highly recommend. Uh, God's face. And if there's a place to post things, I'll I'll post the 90 wondering questions. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Hello. My name's Andy, and I am going to be talking about um, another thing that we can use in that second field about share, sowing the seed of sh and like sharing the gospel. So Kelly um, talked about the 15 second testimony, which is our story. And so another way is to talk about God's story. And um, one of the tools to use for that is the bridge diagram, uh, which you can see on the YouTube Gatorson Life page thing under the 401 training videos. Um, but tonight I'm gonna be going through a different one. So yeah, go right into it. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we see uh, in, um, like in the Bible that God is a perfect God and he, created the world with a perfect plan in mind. I hope you guys can see this. It's not so God's plan was for the world to be perfect. And what that means is just um, there to be for there to be perfect harmony and that we're in perfect harmony with God and with each other. And there's no pain, suffering, strife, all that. Um, but I think you can probably agree with me that what we see today is a very different world um, over here that um, is just definitely filled with brokenness. And we can see all around us, even right now with the coronavirus pandemic going on, like we are definitely living in a broken world. Um, yeah, so um, we see like the stark contrast and uh, like how did we get from here to there like it's um just so strange that like god's plan would be so destroyed like this um, but it's because of um our own sin and our own turning away from god and trying to take on um authority that wasn't ours so like we turned away from god we threw his plan aside and we decided that we were god and that we can do whatever we want basically so like um we see a lot of sin causing a lot of brokenness if we think of um like uh war and hurt and pain and um yeah a lot of disease um but also in general like not individually caused but stuff like um yeah disease and um what's the word 
when you go through stuff. Natural, Natural disaster, thank you. <laughs> um, so ultimately in Romans 6, 23, it says that the way to the sin is death. So ultimately this brokenness and all this sin leads to death. And um, again, I feel like we can definitely uh, feel this in our hearts, like in our minds, because we just see it all around us and within us. So we, um, different people have tried different things to try to escape this. Um, so one of them being, um, for example, entertainment, a little TV, sorry if you can't see that. Um, but yeah, so stuff like binge watching shows on Netflix or play video games or even drugs and alcohol and stuff like that. And um, like, uh, we a lot of times we try to use these things to escape this brokenness, um, but eventually we wake back up and we're thrown right back like a bungee cord into this reality of brokenness. Um, another way we try to escape from this is um, through relationships. So friendships, romance, stuff like that, um, putting our hope and our joy in people and other people. But unfortunately, I mean, other people are just as broken as we are, so we're bound to hurt each other, and that brings us right back into this brokenness. Um, another way is through money and success and materialism. Um, and while money itself isn't bad or anything, but a lot of times we can put too much emphasis on that and try to depend on it, but we can't buy our own happiness. We can't buy our way out of this brokenness and fix the problem. So that again brings us right back. And finally, uh, People have tried religion where um, stuff like, oh, if I pray five times a day, if I uh, walk five old ladies across the street, um, then I'll be good and this brokenness will go away. But unfortunately, that is not true. Um, we're still left in this broken world. So um, this is very sad because we're all stuck in this broken world and we can't go back. Except the second half of this verse says, uh, so the way of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So God sent his son Jesus to come down to earth and then die on the cross and to so be raised up again, defeating death. And um, the reason why Jesus was unique is because he was God and he was without sin. He did not deserve this death penalty. Um, but because he was perfect and he still died, because of that, he can offer us this free gift of eternal life. Um, and in order for us to accept that, we just uh, we transfer our trust. Uh, from our own devices, our own methods of trying to escape this brokenness or fix it. Um, and instead, trusting in Jesus and knowing who he is, that he is God, and that he was perfect, and yet he died for us, and um, rose again to um, prove that he was God. And because of his death, we are restored back to uh, God's original perfect plan for us, and given the Holy Spirit to, uh, as a promise and as a mark and seal that we are his children. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's how we can be restored back to God's perfect plan and a perfect relationship with him, um, and as to be his children. Um, so there's two types of people, one over here, where, uh, someone who is still stuck in this brokenness and the sin and, uh, still in this bondage of sin and death, um, and perhaps someone who's trying to, you know, escape the brokenness with their own methods. Or there's a second person over here who, even though is still living in a broken world, uh, is someone who has transferred their trust in knowing that Jesus is God and he's perfect and he died for us and he accepted that free gift of eternal life and is restored. Um, so, um, I don't know, like, what would you say you are? Um, if you say you're over here, then um, it's never too late and never too early to uh, really think about this and pray about it and really accept that free gift. Um, all you have to do is, again, just transfer your trust from your own devices or even just not trying. Um, like, stop trying, I guess, and uh, just really be desperate for uh, that free gift that Jesus offers through what he's already done so you can hear your story. And if you're already here, 
Um, that means, again, you've already transferred your trust. You already trust in Jesus as um, your Savior, as someone who died for you. And the story doesn't end there because we don't just all disappear from this broken world. Um, we're still in this broken world so that we can share this good news with others so that they, too, can transfer their trust in G to Jesus and then be restored back to God um, and have a, like, be his child. So, um, yeah. So that was the three circles. Oops. Three circles. And in a few minutes, you're going to turn, or you're going to practice this with your training buddies. And um, before that, I just want to make a few notes. Uh, sometimes I do start with the brokenness sphere, the circle, uh, because like in certain situations, that, that might feel more, um, more natural and more uh, caring, I guess. Because like, especially if we're doing prayer on the porch and someone has just shared like um, something that is very evident of the brokenness of this world. Like um, it shows that you really care and empathize with them when you acknowledge that and see that like, man, yeah, that's true. Like this world is very broken and unfortunately you're experiencing it like really like a lot at this time. And then you can juxtapose that with God's perfect plan. But usually I do start with God's perfect plan and uh, just do the chronology, chronology of creation and stuff. So, cool. Um, go ahead and break out into your into the rooms and practice the three circles. Would you do first? <laughs>
Because there's always food and sure drugs. Good. Good. Same time. Uh, those kind of things. Right. So we're uh, trying to be God. God.
about still last year. Yeah. Hello. Um, so we're going to talk about the um, the four responses you get when you share the gospel. Um, so. The first response uh, that we get is a red light. And the red light means that um, their response is that they uh, reject what you're saying and not interested in what you have to say. Um, uh, and the second is um, or the response to that um, for us is to say, thanks for talking. Um, it was, yeah, thanks for your time. Um, and the second would be the yellow light. <laughs> and the yellow light, the response would be that they are interested and would like to meet back up. And our response to that would be to plan to meet back up um, and to set an appointment for that. Um, the third light is a green light, which means that they, um, they are saved, that they decide to put their trust in Christ, And uh, what we would do immediately after they get saved is we want to train them um, in how to share the gospel, or train them, and yeah. And the fourth would be uh, those who are believers, and we, yeah, the... And yeah, our response would be to train them in sharing the gospel and to um, try and get them connected to a church if they are not um, already. Yeah, so those are your four responses to the gospel. <laughs> <laughs> So that, those different parts, uh, they represent, again, I'm going to bring us back to uh, uh, the four fields, five parts, but we've gone through the, the gospel and the emphasis on what is it that we, we share with someone that we run into, uh, uh, different people that, that share the tools, an excellent job. And I trust that there'll be things that, that you can uh, practice, uh, whether it's on your own, in your disciple group. And uh, I want to encourage you, uh, let's continue to be developing these tomorrow night. Uh, we're going to be together and we're going to cover the third field. Uh, for those of you all who can make it, we'll be back here at 7 o'clock. And if not, uh, feel free to join us on Zoom, gatorchristianlife.com slash Zoom. And before we end up, uh, I wanted to ask from our, our studio audience, as far as uh, I talk about the 30 days on mission, and our, our goal is each day just to do something on mission. And we, we give some suggestions. I encourage you, if you're, if you're not uh, on the uh, the evangelism channel of Discord, make sure you turn that on. And because every day, uh, we've already gone through six days, but for the next six, uh, for the 30 days, each day we're going to give a suggestion hey, why don't you consider doing this? And uh, for example, uh, today's suggestion was uh, memorize a verse on God's heart. 
for the nations. And just a, it's a real simple, practical thing to do. So you've got that uh, that, that hopefully will affect our hearts. But uh, I'm going to ask from y'all, what, what are some things that you've done over the course of these six days? Uh, some ways that you've been on mission uh, just could be pretty elaborate. It could be super simple. But uh, over yeah. on the porch. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, this technically started before the 30 days of mission, but I realized like I, I have not been a light basically at all in my neighborhood. And so I started, uh, Marissa, my wife, suggests that we take more time together individually with the boys, especially as uh, Malachi's taking so much attention. So we started taking them on adventures. And basically that's, uh, uh, oops. Uh, well, I'll take the I'll take the, one of the boys on a walk through the neighborhood, or pull them in the wagon, and uh, and what I, I like the idea of like walks with dad being a thing. I think that's what like you mentioned that like that was something you and your dad did, and so like that we never evangelized. That's a good well, idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, like, uh, so it's like it's a, but now it's a way that uh, um, uh, it's like when I get to spend time with my boys, but also trying to engage with anyone we see outside from a an appropriate distance. Um, So me and Jan are making ourselves available to help people. And you all have a personal testimony track, which is just a little piece of folded up paper that you can give to people if you're feeling afraid to talk to them, maybe, or you don't have enough time to talk to them. And that's just a little bit of your story and it has the gospel in it. Um, I know for me, it's opened up a lot of opportunities. Just like sometimes I go to a restaurant, I'll give it to my cashier. And I'll come back after my food is out and they're like, man, like I just had this experience the other day and I feel like God's really trying to draw me to himself. And so sometimes something that can feel like maybe a little bit cheesy to give or strange can really open up a further conversation. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have one, me and Jan would love to help you make your testimony track. Mm -hmm. Good, good. I can see a future missions challenge in the works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. Nice one. I put my names map like right at the end of my bed, kind of like where I would see it <laughs> when I wake up and when I go to bed. And so I've been spending time right before I go to bed to be praying for them as well as on my way to work because I'm work is on my mind when I'm working every day. And so I pray for them also on my way to prepare my mind to know how to be a blessing to them. And I've actually been this week trying to think of ways to specifically serve each one in my office um and so i've been doing that doing whether it's giving them a card and a, a gift with it or sharing with them how i appreciate them just opening ways to have more conversation with them good well keep it up and i encourage you uh, if you haven't committed to those 30 days of, of uh, mission, go for it. And what have you got to lose? And I think it's a tremendous opportunity just to, to build that lifestyle of being on mission. So we'll have some more suggestions coming out every day. Look forward to that. And uh, yeah. well, let me, let me close this in prayer. Uh, we're going to end a bit early, but we look forward to Catching you tomorrow as well. Uh, Lord, I just really thank you for our time together. Uh, we're grateful for the opportunity to, to be trained and what to share. Lord, uh, it's amazing how many Christians uh, may even uh, be compelled to share their faith, but they don't know what to share. Uh, they're not clear on the gospel, and so they hold back. And Lord, um, and that's probably us in different forms. I pray all the more as, as we uh, get down these tools, they become second nature, that that would not be something that would hold us back from uh, being a light to others, that we might uh, just proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. We thank you for all that you're doing and preparing us, our hearts, as well as our minds. We give you all this for your glory, Christ's name. Good night.